And I remember the, the, the lenders were saying, tell your multifamily owners to expect 25 to 50% collections May 1st. Wow. And I mean, I got off that call, you know, I was, you know, trying to put on a smiley face to host that call. I got off of it that night. I said to my wife, I said, should we stop paying our mortgage to get ahead of this and start, you know, you know, is this going to be a three year downturn again? And it just, it's just amazes me that it's gone, you know, through the roof again. Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Reed Bennett, CCIM, serves as National Council Chair of Multifamily Properties for SVN International and a Senior Vice President for SVN Chicago Commercial. As a licensed managing broker for over 20 years, he focuses primarily on the sale of apartment communities across the Midwest and also teams up with members of his council to serve clients across the country in over 150 markets. Reed prides himself on understanding the nuances of an, an analysis of multiple unit apartment dwellings in low income Section 8 and Section 42 communities. Reed, welcome to the show. Hey, Sam. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. The pleasure's mine. Where are you based out of? I'm based in Chicago, Chicago, Illinois. My gosh, sure. I've I've had a few uh, a few guests come on the show from Chicago, and that I tell all of them the same thing every year for my birthday. And I won't name the pizzeria I ship it from, but I ship overnight FedEx, or my wife does because it's the same birthday present every year. A <laughs> frozen pizza that they put on pack on dry ice. She ships a bunch of frozen pizzas to me out of one of my favorite Chicago pizzerias. So lucky you or lucky me, I don't live in your city because otherwise I'd just be enormously fat from eating pizza. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds so, good. I could probably guess which one it is. Yeah, well, you know, we don't want to play favorites here. We might start <laughs> We might start a war the same as we started a war if we set our favorite barbecue That's here true. in Memphis. So either way, hey, you know, the same questions I ask everybody who comes on this show, mm-hmm. Reed, can you quickly tell us where did you start, where are you now, and how did you get there? That's a good question. Well, I mean, I, I started my real estate career here in Chicago in 2001. Uh, it was a, a boutique, uh, multifamily-focused uh, investment sales firm. Uh, I was the youngest by about 25 years, and uh, so it was a bunch of dinosaurs that were putting out one-page offering memorandums with just the numbers. <laughs> you know, so I, I started in the neighborhoods of Chicago. I would go up and down the streets. I would take pictures back. You know, in 2001, the digital cameras would hold about 90 photos, right. <laughs> if you remember that. I do. Um, so I would take about 90 photos, I'd come back in, I'd, I'd catalog them all, I would look them up on the assessor's office, figure out who owns them. And I would take a zip code in Chicago uh, and go a zip code by zip code until I had the entire northwest side of Chicago tracked. And then started selling you know, actually everything I sold from 2001 until probably 2007 was the condo converters. I remember thinking, you know, I was, I was 25 years old, I remember thinking, Every single apartment building in America is going to be converted into a condominium. Mm. I mean, I believe that that's how fast it was going. I had 176 condo converters in the northwest side of Chicago in my database alone. Wow. So started doing that. I actually didn't even know how to run uh, income and expenses on a property until after 2007, which is when I went and got my CCIM designation. Uh, when things kind of shifted because it didn't matter. All I was doing was measuring the units with a laser measure telling the guys, you know, here's how big the kitchens, bathrooms, you know, living rooms, you know, you can convert this dining room into a bedroom and add extra, you know, value to the, to the condo units. And that's all these guys cared about. I mean, we were at that time we were, I remember there were, there was one particular instance where the lady did not want to disturb any of her tenants. So we went into the basement and she kind of looked up and we saw the firewall. She said, here's, you know, here's where the, the living room is. Yeah, over here is where the dining room is. You know, here's where the bedrooms are. You can see the soil stack. So, you know, here's where the bathrooms are. And I remember going out to the car and we, were, we wrote a contract on the hood of my car. And the guy goes, take it back in there. I mean, that's how hot it was with conversion. So I gave it back to her and we'd sign it up right there. I mean, those days are done, but um you know, so that then after the condo uh, bust really happened, 
Uh, I started moving out into uh, the suburban markets to garden style apartment complexes and started moving further and further outside of Chicago across the Midwest and getting involved in, you know, not only market rate, but affordable housing. And that's, you know, the, the section 42, the, the low income housing tax credit, light tech deals, uh, and project based section eight HAP contracted properties. And that's where we are right now working in both, both arenas. That is fantastic. I love, uh, you know, a lot of things Glory mm-hmm. one is just how, how fast things have changed. Yeah. Right. I mean, 20 years ago, yes. Taking pictures, 90 pictures, and then trying to compare into the assessor's office and creating your own, ver- your own version of Google maps one sure. mile at a time. My gosh, that's a, that's a tedious process. Absolutely. Uh, you know, so how things have changed and then just how investor appetite and demand changes, right? The condo conversion thing. I mean, is that all but dead at this point or where, where is yeah. that? That's all but dead. I mean, in fact, a lot of the condos in and around the Chicago market are being purchased and deconverted back into apartments, which if you would have told me that in 2007, eight, nine, that that's what, what was going to be happening in 2020 and 2021, I, I would have bet my house that it wouldn't happen. And wow. that's what's happening. I mean, so guys are going through the brain damage of, I mean, here in uh, in Illinois, you only have to have 75% of the condo association approval in order to force, the, you know, if there's a 25% holdout, if 75% agree, you can force the 25% to sell at uh, the current market rate price. So it's, it's, it's kind of a strange business. I know I have a number of clients, that that's all they do. It's, you know, you kind of have to have a steel stomach to do that, but uh, that's what they're doing. And in fact, it's, it's the properties are more valuable now as apartment buildings than as condos, which I mean, I still can't get my, you know, my brain wrapped around that. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. Yeah, that, that, that is just interesting how demand changes, investor sentiment changes, and um, yeah, that's uh, that's just that's just wild, and, and nobody has that crystal ball, right? Well, because that- shoot, if you would have told me in April of 2020 that pricing would have gone up and cap rates would have compressed, I would have eaten my house as well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I remember it because I, I host a quarterly uh, national multifamily call internally for SVN, and I had um, lenders on. And the, the call was, it was the last Thursday of the month in April of 2020, going into to May of 2020. And I remember the, the, the lenders were saying, tell your multifamily owners to expect 25 to 50% collections May 1st. Wow. And I mean, I got off that call, you know, I was, you know, trying to put on a smiley face to host that call. I got off of it. That night I said to my wife, I said, should we stop paying our mortgage to get ahead of this and start, you know, you know, is this going to be a three year downturn again? And it just, it's just amazes me that it's gone, you know, through the roof again. So I'm sure you're seeing the same things when you're trying to come up with some multifamily deals. I mean, the the competition is ridiculous right now. Oh, it is. It is. And, and, you know, who knows what the, you know, where this all shakes out in the end, Again, kind of like the condo conversion story. It's like, we don't know where this leads. Right. Uh, you know, in the end, if we just repriced assets with all of his money printing, and now this is just the new the new pricing compared to the old, it's all relative to the amount of money we've actually gotten the supply. I don't know. Uh, yeah. In the system, who who really knows? But that's uh, that's wild. Talk to us really about what you guys are seeing from, on the, from the brokerage perspective on affordable and market rate. But before we dig into that, can you define those terms for us, please? Well, to define all of the affordability components to the affordable housing, it, it would take another, another podcast uh, okay. entirely for that. But basically, when I say market rate, that just means, you know, regular market apartment housing. So just when you see your typical apartment unit um, that anybody from a, a professional to you know a student is, is renting, that'd just be a market rate. When you get over to the affordability side, um, that's in, usually if you're going into the section 42, that's the low income housing tax credit product. That is income restricted. And typically it's about 60% or below the median area income or the area median income at the AMI. And so you just have to income qualify the tenants. And that was just a program that was created in the 80s to provide affordable housing 
uh, in areas where there really isn't any. And so, and then on the, you know, the extreme side of the affordable housing is the project based section eight or the half contract, which is housing assistant payments. And that's where the entire building is, is under a section eight contract. So the owner of that building gets one check for all of the tenants rather than voucher systems. Uh, for those of you familiar with, you know, the voucher system out there. Right, right. That's fantastic. Yeah, thanks, thanks for taking the time to quickly explain uh, that in what detail you can uh, on a short podcast here. Walk us through what you guys are seeing in the market. I know prices, we talked a little bit about going through the roof, but how are you guys finding value as brokers for your buyers? Well, so so we track every single uh, existing apartment complex, 50 units and above uh, across the Midwest and in various other parts of the country. Uh, We also have about five systems that track the rents. A couple of our systems are connected to the USPS system, where it tracks open and uh, operable mailboxes. So that's how they track occupancy on apartment complexes. And so we just utilize a lot of it. And we give all this stuff to, uh, you know, to our clients, you know, looking to buy property, uh, the clients looking to sell just to help them figure out what the value is of a certain property. So, you know, in this market, it's been very difficult to, to pin down values, which, which is why I've seen a couple of people sell their deals off market. It's not the market to do that uh, because there are so many different execution strategies for a certain asset. You just don't know where the highest and best price is going to come until you take that out to market, you know, and we're really having great success doing call for offers uh, during this time period, Hmm. just because, you know, rather than pricing, we used to try to price everything. Right. And so that's setting a target. And then people just try to hit that target. Some of these deals, if we set that, we don't know what the value is anymore. I mean, so we can, we can come up with a value range, uh, with the owner and then say, here's where, our, you know, we reasonably expect offers to come in and we kind of do a black swan um, evaluation to say, Hey, here's where a majority of the offers are going to come in this, this range. Here's where the, the low ballers are going to c- try to come in and, you know, steal it from you. And then here's where we're looking for the, the, you know, the black swan, the group that has capital that they're, you know, their cost of capital is 2%. So they're, they're able to, you know, try to undercut everybody else. I mean, we're also looking at significant hard earnest money deposits day one, which, I mean, I, I just had a client lose out on a deal in, um, I think it was Mississippi. And it was just, it was a small deal. It was like an $8 million deal. Somebody came in with a $2 million hard earnest money deposit day one, blew him out of the water. So it's just been crazy what we're seeing out there in this market. How do buyers protect themselves and how can they create value? I guess, what are you seeing them do to create value in such a competitive environment? Well, I I think there are a number of ways. And a majority of it comes from the data that you have available. Mm. If you have data like, you know, we use a number of systems. There's a couple systems that that I I use that tracks. uh, It's connected with the Yardi management software. And... It can track around the property as long as there are seven or more properties on the Yardi platform. It can give you an aggregate of income and expenses for all of those properties so you can underwrite the deal within that market without even having you know, the exact income and expenses from, from an owner. So certain systems like that, and then we cross-check it with two other systems. If you have that available to you and, and are very strong in a certain market, you can do that kind of, you know, non-refundable day one if you know the property, have a pretty good feel for it. Um, I mean, typically, you're, you know, the the earnest money is refundable if there are environmental issues or title issues. So things like that that you have no no idea about. That's the only thing that'll save you with non-refundable earnest money that I've seen in the contracts. Right, right. Yeah, that's uh, that's really interesting. And, and and talking about you know the the data you know maybe that you guys have at your fingertips. What's what's a good strategy for you know guy off the street or a small firm up the street to get their hands on that complex of a data set? 
Well, rather than trying to buy all these systems themselves and spend the hours to do that, I would just align yourself with a broker that's in that market that specializes with, you know, with multifamily. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to share these systems, especially, you know, when a buyer comes to me and says, look, I'm looking at this property, you know, can you share the information that you have? I mean, even if I'm not involved in the deal, I'll, I'll share it with them um, if it's a relationship that I have. So, I mean, we have one of our systems that we use, it shows you the differences between studios, ones, twos, three bedrooms with the comp set and tells you exactly where you are as it relates to the competitive set on a per square foot, a unit mix or a unit price, you know, and what all, all the amenities are with each one of those properties. So you can, we've identified deals where they were about 40 cents a square foot below the market. So those are the kind of deals where you say you see traded at a, a four cap or a three cap. You're like, how the hell did this guy do this? Well, it's because day one, he's going to go in there and raise the rents $250 without even putting any kind of value add into it. And you're going to make it an eight and a half cap, right. you know, after year one. So I, I would look for, you know, the, the regular investor that's trying to find deals. You know, if you're familiar with the market driving up and down the, your, your market daily, you know, you look for signs of, you know, deferred maintenance on the properties. I mean, I, I went to a property in my market that the doors were all open uh, going into the corridors and the shutters were missing. And, you know, you, you can see the fascias like coming off and they're not repairing simple things that they're not repairing. The grass is too tall. I mean, that's signs of distress. And those would be those would be targets, um, you know, to take a look at. Also, I, I would look at long term ownership. Uh, again, majority of the brokers are tracking how long the owners have had a property. I mean, we've sold a couple deals where owners uh, had owned them for over 40 years. Wow. And when, you, when you're in at that kind of a basis, you don't care about pushing rents. So those are the great value add where, you know, you're 100, 200, 250 under market walking in day one. I also love month to month leases. A lot of people are afraid of those. We sold a 142 unit deal that had month to month leases. They were all $200 under. We sold it to the group. The first month they owned it, they signed 118 of the 142 leases at $100 higher. And all they did was say, look, you can stay month to month, but we're raising you $200. If you sign an annual lease, we'll only raise you 100. They got everybody else the next month. And then the following year, they raised them 10%. So, I mean, that, 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 that went from a $5 million deal to a $12 million deal, you know, in two years. Right. With just some, just some basic strategy in how they're going to go about raising rents to more market pricing. Yeah. That's brilliant. That is brilliant. That uh, I love some of those things that you're talking about, you know, looking for long-term owners, you know, tell us, you know, you are the multifamily chair for SVN. Is that right? That's correct. So how many, how many brokers work underneath, underneath you across the U.S.? Well, they're not underneath me. So every, everybody's in their own office, but we have about 266 multifamily focused advisors in the 225 offices around the country. We're in every single market, whether it's primary, secondary, and, and most of the tertiary markets around the United States. So what I've really enjoyed, especially in this position, is I've been able to work with a number of uh, my colleagues around the country um, that are boots on the ground in all these markets. And so in essence, I can help clients of mine in any market they want to enter, uh, whether it be buying, selling, uh, or if they just need, you know, market analysis, uh, we're able to do that with, you know, a lot of my colleagues throughout the country. I mean, right now we have about six deals that we're working on, you know, about 2,500 units around the country, just with some of my colleagues uh, that are in different markets from Texas to New York to, you know, uh, the Dakotas, Midwest, you know, all over the place. That's, that's fantastic. I love that. When you guys have, you know, your quarterly <clears throat> calls, I know you said you host that quarterly call. Talk to us about some of the buzz maybe that is had on those calls. Like, can you give it, can you give us any, any insight into, Maybe some of the things that we wouldn't expect that, that is kind of the, the, the buzz on the street or from the street level with all of your brokers. Well, I, I think that everybody is, is experiencing a, a similar situation that we are. Um, you know, we have advisors that as they're putting the OMs together, the, you know, the offering memorandums for the deals, 
people are calling them and they're saying, hey, I'm putting this deal, this 150 unit deal together right now with the OM. And people are saying, where is it? Right. And they're saying, okay, here's the address. Look, I'm sending a contract to you. Right. I mean, so we're putting deals under contract. And so are many of my other clients or colleagues across the country prior to even completing the OMs. Wow. Which, I mean, I, it's just, I mean, so r- right now, I mean, we have 54 and a half million of multifamily under contract. We have 45.2 million of LOI. And then we're marketing 55.7 million. I mean, that, that's the most we've ever, that's more than a two year period in my 20 years in the business that we've been, you know, as far as activity. Right. So the activity is just crazy. You know, we're, we're calling it uh, smash and grab time because we don't, you don't, you don't know how long it's going to last. Well, that's it. I mean, how long will it last? And, you know, does that give you any concern that at some point the, the music will stop and, and everyone's going to have to find a chair? Well, after going through 2008, 9, and 10, I'm always paranoid of that, <laughs> you know? So, but as you know, there are cycles, everything goes in cycles. There's always ups and there's always going to be downs. There's always going to be buys of your life each year is the way I look at it. You're always going to find a deal of a lifetime every year if you're looking hard enough and connecting with enough people. Whether it's a you know 2008 market, nine market, 2020 market, it doesn't matter. There's there there are reasons people are selling in every single market, and there's a reason you should buy in every single market. I think that's really sound advice. You know because the the one the one line you never that I never listened to is well all the good deals are gone like eh, whatever whatever that I, I don't buy that so so with you know with that being said you can always find the deal of your life in in any particular year i think the more intriguing part of that kind of analysis is that we never know why someone's selling yes uh, so often it's 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 not the money we would assume you know from this side of the table it's always the money but you never know why someone is uh punting the asset they're, that they're punting so. I, I would agree with you. I would say more often than not, it isn't the money. It's some other reason in their life. Mm. You know, I, I remember when I first got into the business, I would call everybody in this certain location, a certain zip code of Chicago. And I talked, I met with this gentleman, you know, he's probably 72 years old. It was his only apartment building in Chicago. And, you know, he said, I'm never selling this asset. Six months later, I saw it hit CoStar that it closed. And I called him up. I said, well, you just told me you know, uh, not too long ago, you'll never sell. He said, look, I wasn't, but I got prostate cancer Mm. and I wanted to spend, you know, the rest of my years with my grandkids as much as possible. So, I mean, you just, you never know. Partnership disputes are my favorite as well. You know, first off, because they're going to sell the asset. Second off, now I have two clients, (laughs) you know, (laughs) so what do you see on that front? I mean, let's 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 chase that rabbit hole for just a second. <laughs> what, why or what do you think are some of the more prominent reasons that partnerships are falling apart in the real estate space? Well, I think there's just there there are a number of ways to run, especially multifamily assets, and most of the times partners aren't going to agree. Some some of the partners want to, you know. We were working on a, a portfolio of assets right now with a group. There were three partners involved. One or two of them wanted to just refinance, pull all their equity out, which to me, I, I mean, I love that concept. If you have zero equity into a deal and it's generating you, you know, the returns that were at or better than what you were, you know, you bought the deal. Why wouldn't you do that and keep going? Um, but the one group said, look, I don't want to put another mortgage on this. So that was a reason for them to dissolve. Uh, they ended up buying each other out and, you know, so there are just a number of reasons. Some people want to add value, continue adding value. Some people just want to take the cash flow uh, and milk the property. I mean, there's just, there's just so many, re- just like anything else, you know, partners for life. When you're married, things come up that were different than when you started. So, you know, no, no different in business. It's really not. And, and I think a lot of times we want to, we want to investigate those, what went wrong scenarios just so we can learn from them. And sure. in the end, I think maybe there's no way to ever mitigate all of those potential, you know, ways that deals go sideways. Well, I mean, if you don't have a partnership agreement that everybody signs at the beginning, that would be one red flag with a partnership. I mean, where everybody has specific roles and, and they know what their roles are. 
I've seen a number of groups, you know, just kind of haphazardly put, you know, deals together. Some guys have the management end. Some some guys have the, you know, the capital raise ends, you know. And, and so along the lines, people start saying, well, wait a minute, I'm doing all the work here, you know, on the management side, you know, and the person saying, well, yeah, I raised all the money for you to get that, you know, so it's like, you know, e- there are no egos in multifamily at all. I mean, <laughs> Look, that, it, speaking of that, I mean, that's, that's, one of the, that's one of the reasons I have a client that says, you know, I could never sell my deal direct to a, to a buyer because my ego is so big, I would just screw it up. He goes, that's why I need you to take what I'm saying, soften it up and deliver it. <laughs> um, so, I like that. I like yeah. that. You, you, you need someone to run interference for you. Hey, <laughs> hey that's an honest soul. Right. I appreciate, you know, that honesty. That's fantastic. Yeah. When you think about, uh, you know, the multifamily space, we've talked about, you know, market rate deals, affordable rate deals or affordable deals. Um, We've talked about just kind of the fear, you know, of of where we are in the market cycle and what you guys see, you know, happening. Is there anything else that really inside of multifamily that you would say that is that is a timely piece of information that you wish other people were thinking more about right now? Mm, that's a good question that I wish someone was thinking more about. You know, I, I just, I think that people are really focused on inflation coming up. Mm. Uh, we have a number of, uh, you know, I, I just had a conversation yesterday with an owner that, you know, I just said, Hey, would you, would you consider taking a look at a crazy price, uh, you know, for your deal? Cause he was, he was telling me, I can't, I can't find anything. And every, everything I get involved in, there's five other offers that are way above mine. I said, well, do you want to take advantage of this market uh, on the flip side and, and and sell your 120 unit deal? He said, no, I'm, I'm waiting for inflation to hit. My deal is going to be worth way more. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think people have to be mindful of that, that inflation is coming, you know, a lot faster than wages are increasing in this, in this country right now. And that's kind of concerning. So, right. right. Can you walk us through why that is concerning? Well, it's concerning because, well, look, it, just simplistically, you know, you're talking about the, the cost of a gallon of milk. I mean, if, you're, if your wages aren't going up, but the cost of milk is going up, the cost of, I mean, obviously we've seen what happened with lumber and copper during, you know, uh, for the uh, construction. All these things are going up, but wages are not. It's kind of just cause for concern because it's just going to be outpricing everything. And, and but what that's doing in the multifamily space is, it's, it's actually positive for the multifamily space because it's widening the gap for home ownership and forcing people to, 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 to remain renters. Uh, I mean, we're a renter nation. People are not interested in buying homes, especially from the downturn of 2008, 9, and 10. A lot of the, you know, the uh, Gen Xers and uh, millennials saw their, their parents lose their house in the downturn. They're saying, why, why would I do this? Why would I get involved in it? Especially if they want to be mobile. Right. If you want to go from Chicago to San Francisco to New York, wherever you want, you don't want to put your condo on the market. Wait for that to happen. They, they want to be nimble and be able to rent. And, and to me, I think that's a much smarter thing to do because you still have to come up with a 5 to 10 to 20% down payment for a home. Why not take that money and invest it you know, with you guys uh, in a multifamily deal? Right. Right. And rent. And rent where you want. Rent where that's you want. It. Yeah, that's interesting. I guess one thought with that is that if the if inflation does happen, right? Inflation goes up, mm-hmm. uh, wages remain the same, mm-hmm. then that means there's even less money available for people to pay towards <laughs> rent. Which if there's less money for people to pay towards rent, that means there's less NOI necessarily on the bottom line. And if these are traded as a multiple of NOI then maybe the asset prices of your multifamily holdings don't go up. That's a good point. I don't know. That's a good, that's a good point. I mean, you can only, you can only, you know, stretch the rental rate so much until the market starts pushing back saying, look, I can't afford it. I'm going to move out further right. and move out of the core into the suburban markets, or I'm going to move out of the suburban markets into tertiary markets just because I can't afford this anymore. Especially with the fact that people don't necessarily need to be in an office anymore in the core markets. So we see a lot of people that were downtown in high rises in Chicago, move out to the, the Chicago suburbs. Mm-hmm. They get a lot more space. They get an extra bedroom. 
for less money. So if we continue to see this, that's going to be interesting for the, you know, the higher priced multifamily assets in the country. Yeah, this whole this whole thing is uh, it's certainly an interesting time that we're living through, and 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 uh, the blueprint for this certainly has not been printed. So it, uh, I guess that doesn't make sense at all. Blueprint hasn't been printed. <laughs> You're right. I, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. <laughs> thank, thank you, Reed. You, you 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 are our gracious guest. A few questions here for you, Reed. Before we jump off the show, if you were to help our listeners avoid just one mistake in real estate, what would it be, and how would you avoid it? I think the mistake would be don't fall in love with an asset. Uh, We've had guys fall in love with assets. And so then they end up stretching and stretching and stretching and coming back. Don't do it. Uh, it, it, The numbers don't lie. Um, And just, you know, trust the numbers, trust your underwriting and don't go outside your comfort zone. I mean, the other thing is don't go outside your, the asset class that, you know, we've had, you know, what we've seen also another reason why I think multifamily has been ridiculous as far as the cap rate compression and and increase in value is a lot of the retail and office buyers stopped buying those asset classes and jumped into multifamily without understanding it. And I think that's going to be where a lot of those groups are going to be caught not understanding the product. I mean, we, we know, we know multifamily owners that have tried to get into the office space and lost their, you know, lost their hat. Uh, in the office space or tried to get into retail or tried to get into, you know, single tenant net lease deals and didn't understand the, you know, the lease term. So I would say learn your lane, stay in your lane and don't fall in love with the deal. I love that. That's that sound advice. That is very sound advice. Thanks for sharing that. Next question for you when it comes to investing in the world, what's one thing you're doing right now to make the world a better place? Well, you know, I just started coaching multifamily advisors recently, and uh, it's been it's been really nice to kind of give back after being in the business for 20 years and kind of learning the ups and downs and what to do and not to do and to, to provide that back. Um, you know, we also every year we go to the uh, the food depository and, and volunteered around Christmas time for them. Yeah. So those are a couple of things we're doing now. That's fun. That's fun. Both professional and personal give back. That's super cool. Reed, if our listeners want to get in touch with you, what is the best way to do that? Well, you can reach me on my cell, which is 773-251-7342, or my email, which is reed.bennett at svn.com. That's R-E-I-D, period, B-E-N-N-E-T-T at S-V-N, Sam Victor Nancy.com. Awesome. Reed, thank you so much for your time today. I do appreciate it. Absolutely, Sam. Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Podcast. If you can do me a favor and subscribe and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, whatever platform it is you use to listen, if you can do that for us, that would be a fantastic help to the show. It helps us both attract new listeners as well as rank higher on those directories. So appreciate you listening. Thanks so much and hope to catch you on the next episode.